Welcome to the Arlington Author Salon for this chilly January evening. I hope you are all cozy wherever you are. And I want to remind you all that um, throughout this whole presentation, you can add questions to the Q&A or to chat. And um, we have a Q&A session at the end of the salon. So I'm going to start with um, introducing myself. <laughs> I'm Andrea Nikolai. I'm your MC, and I'm also the director of libraries for the town of Arlington. I wish you a happy winter. I thank you for beaming in with us this evening. Tonight's Arlington Author Salon theme is life, art, and family in history's shadow. We are so incredibly lucky to have three authors with us this evening, Helen Fremont, Elena Limberski, and Wayna Di Randell. The Salon is a free reading series with a twist. Each author's presentation includes a sensory experience to complement their reading, whether it be music, photos, tasty treats, fabrics, even sculpture and smells, although Zoom webinar has its limitations. The Salon normally takes place at the Kickstand Cafe in Arlington Center on a quarterly basis, the first week of January, April, July, and October, with some, ex um, some exceptions, excuse me, to circumvent holidays. Our next salon will take place April 7th. A few notes as you settle in, the salon is recorded and will later be viewable on Arlington Community Media's TV channel and on demand at acmi.tv. We're so happy to have them as a partner. The list of attendees is not viewable during the program and it won't be viewable in this recording. Each author will have 15 minutes to read and we'll have a combined Q&A at the end of the program. And as I mentioned earlier, the chat and Q&A functions are enabled. You can enter a question for the authors at any point during the program and I'll pose the questions at the end during the Q&A period. I wanna give a nod to our usual host, Emily and the staff of the wonderful Kickstand Cafe, a home away from home for many writers and Arlingtonians. I also wanna credit salon co-organizers, Anjali Mitterduva, Whitney Scherer, and Amy Yellen. This program this evening is sponsored in part by a grant from the Arlington Cultural Council and the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, which is in turn supported by a state agency, the Massachusetts Cultural Council. The program usually takes place in the heart of the Arlington Cultural District, which was de designated in 2017 by the Mass Cultural Council. Books are for sale courtesy of the Book Rack, our local bookseller in Arlington, and that URL is book-rack.com. We'll share out that link during the, actually, I think it might be shared out already, but if it's not, it will be soon. So our first author this evening is Helen Fremont. Helen Fremont's new memoir, The Escape Artist, was published in 2020 by Simon & Schuster and was selected as a New York Times Editor's Choice book. It was also chosen by People Magazine as a best new book in 2020. Her nationally best-selling first memoir, After Long Silence, was selected by the New York Times as a new and noteworthy book in 2000. Her works of fiction and nonfiction have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including Prize Stories, the O. Henry Awards, the New York Times, Plowshares, and the Harvard Review. I would like you to please welcome to the stage, Helen Fremont. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, having a little technical problems here with pushing buttons, but I really appreciate your introduction. And I'm so grateful to you and Anjali and Amy and everyone at the Robbins Library for hosting this event. And it's a real honor to be here with um, Yelena and Wena, who are terrific writers and you should get their books. Um, in keeping with the show and tell format, I'm going to do a um, a really a kind of a blitz through my family um, history. Uh, there are 49 slides. Um, many of the pictures here are not actually authentic Fremont family pictures. Um, you might be able to tell the difference. Some I just pulled off the, off the web, but I just wanted to illustrate the story somehow. So um, to start with, my sister and I were raised in upstate New York. We were in a very nuclear family of uh, just my mother, my father, and my older sister, Laura, and me. This is not me and my sister. Anybody who knew us knew, would know we would never be caught dead in these outfits, but um, it does at least introduce us. 
Uh, my parents never, never spoke about the past. They, we knew they were from Eastern Europe. We knew that they were sole survivors of their family. They had survived World War II and that everyone else was killed. But we were never to ask about the past because it was just too painful. We were raised Roman Catholic, um, but found out in our 30s that, in fact, our parents were Jewish Holocaust survivors. And we found that out in 1992. As you can see on the left, I'm a lawyer. And my sister, Laura, was a doctor at the time. And the way we found out was through these pages of testimony that were sent to us in a big packet by a rabbi at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel. And my sister had sent out an inquiry thinking perhaps we would find out maybe there were some other family members that, that we didn't know about. Um, and we, we were shocked to find that, in fact, we got pages like this, which is written in Yiddish, um, that this one is showing that my mother's mother was gassed at the extermination camp of Belgitz in 1943. Uh, this is another page of testimony that shows that my mother's father was gassed at Belgitz. And here's another one showing that my father's mother was also gassed at Belgitz in the spring of 1943. And it turns out there were dozens and dozens of relatives that we didn't even know about. We had aunts and uncles and cousins. And these pages of testimony described how they were either gassed or shot or starved in the ghettos. And we were just overwhelmed with um, the amount of information that we received and we weren't sure what to do. So we sat down and did a ton of research. And in 1992, there was no internet. So we ended up reading a lot of history and writing to other survivors. Um, our parents were in their seventies. And so there were an awful lot of survivors of their generation who were still alive. And we went to their hometown in Lvov, which was now Ukraine. And, um, and we went to Israel and we did as much research as we could trying to find people who knew our parents. And finally, we sat down and talked with our parents and we got the story of how they had survived. Um, so this is a map of uh, Europe before World War, whoops, um, before World War II. And you can see Germany in red in the middle and Poland is off to the east in blue. And I put a little um, magenta star near Lvov, which is the city that my parents were from. Um, now, this is the only photo I have of any of my family that predates the war. This is a, uh, the, the medical school identification card for my father from 1936 when he was 21 years old. And this was also the year that he met my mother. And she was a high school senior. And uh, he crashed the party at her high school. This is my mom. I don't have any pictures of her from before the war. This was taken um, 10 years later in 1946. Anyway, they fell in love and they were going to be married. Um, they were just waiting for my father to uh, graduate from medical school. But before he could, the war broke out. And in September of 1939, the Russians took over Lvov because we'll go back to our maps um, here on the left again before the war. Um, you have the little, the little star showing where my parents were from, and the Germans and Russians divided Poland between themselves. And basically, Russia was given the eastern part, and you can see that Lvov now is um, under Russian occupation. So what happened under the Russians is that as soon as my father graduated medical school, he was arrested as a socially dangerous element, and he was sent to Siberia um, as, a, as a slave laborer in the Gulag. And um, basically no one ever heard from people who went off to Siberia. That was the end of them. They either starved to death or froze to death. And in fact, my mother and uh, her family never heard anything further from him for six years. Um, a year later, the Germans broke their agreement with their Russian, the Russians and invaded uh, Russia and took over the city of Lvov. And this was in June of 1941. So again, there was Lvov sitting in under Russian occupation. And then to the right, you see what Lvov, um, Germany had just exploded and invaded north, south, east, and west. And they pushed the Russians out. And now Lvov was under German occupation. 
And under the Germans, my mother and her parents and families were all forced into the ghetto and they were forced to wear the Jewish star. Um, as they had an armband, so um, they were required to identify as Jews. And my mother was managed to support her parents by um, pretending to be a Polish Catholic. And she had a real gift for language. She was fluent in several languages, including Italian, because her older sister had earlier married an Italian. We'll get to her later. But uh, my mother got a job pretending to be a Polish Catholic girl and worked for an Italian officer stationed in Lvov in the Aryan section of town. And the, ally, I mean, the Italians were allied with the Germans. So she was able to, at the end of her workday, smuggle food from the Aryan section of town back into the ghetto, put on her, her Jewish armband. And at night, she was able to keep her parents alive with the food that she brought. And she was able to keep that up for about a year and a half until October of 1942, when uh, the Germans liquidated the, the ghetto. And my mother ended up having to escape. She cut her hair short, she got false papers, and she dressed up as an Italian soldier and marched out of Poland dressed as an Italian soldier with the Italian army. Uh, but she was arrested at the border. She was imprisoned and in a, in a concentration camp. And uh, it was about nine months later that she was released in July of 1943. And she went to live with her older sister, Zosha, who had married an Italian. And this is actually, I think, the building that they lived in at that time in Rome. This is my aunt Zosha, and she was seven years older than my mother. And here is Uncle Giulio. He was the Italian count. He's actually the only authentic Catholic in our family. And um, he was a lawyer and he was really into heraldry. This was not his daily outfit, but he was very proud of being um, a knight of the order of Malta. And this is his, you know, he really got into the, the little medals and the cape and everything and the feather cap. And so here he is posing um, as his, as a knight in the order of Malta. Um, and now we have a picture, a few pictures from after the war in 1946. This is my aunt with my three-year-old cousin, her son, ostensibly, Renzo. Uh, all this time, for the last six years, my father has been in forced labor camps in Siberia, and no one has heard anything of him and assumed he was dead, but he was not dead. And in fact, he managed to escape um, in the summer of 46. Uh, so it was about a year after the war was already over. Um, and he ended up jumping on a train. He was up above the Arctic Circle. He was in sort of the, the upper right-hand corner of this picture in the red zone. And he ended up jumping trains and hanging on and getting to the border with Europe. And then he walked across Europe all the way to Rome as a fugitive from justice. And in 1946, he found my mother in Rome, and he and my mother married 10 years to the day since they first met. Uh, so this is, in fact, my father and my mother. And again, little Renzo, um, who you can see is really pissed off that my father is now in the picture. Um, it took them another four years before they were able to put together enough documents to um, apply for citizen or not yet citizenship, but just to emigrate to the United States and they came over to New York by boat and my sister and I were born in the 1950s. So now I have a few pictures of just uh, family pictures of me. Um, this is a picture of me when I was 16 and I'm with my uncle Giulio. We're in Montegatini, which was uh, his favorite spa town in Tuscany. He always went for a month in August, and I had just finished uh, youth hosteling all over Europe. So I'm wearing my um, rather unfashionable hiking boots and cutoff shorts. And my uncle, of course, is wearing his, his little ballet slippers, and he looks, he was just a delightful guy. Uh, here I am a few years later. I am um, on the crew team at Wellesley College, and I'm the second from the left in this picture. And uh, another picture of me on the left with Renzo, um, Renzo's daughter. 
1993, and this was taken in Italy. Uh, this, we are not sure who this is. I, I just thought I would throw it in to see if people were still awake. And I decided that I needed to write the story once we had discovered all of these secrets and how our parents survived and the fact that we were Jewish. And as all writers know, um, you know, you need to have a whole bunch of muses and accessories to get yourself inspired to write and you have to have your panic button. And so this was mine. And writing, when you begin, it's really very exciting. You're, you know, like discovering all sorts of buried secrets, but with time, it can also be really exhausting. And um, it took me six years uh, to write this book. And, and I must say that they were not always easy you know, it wasn't always easy to get this down. But finally, in 1999, I was able to um, publish the my first memoir, After Long Silence, which really got down the details of my parents' story as I understood it then. And I thought that I was done. But as it turned out, as a result of that book's publication, even though my sister and I had done so much research and thought we had found everybody who might have known our parents, it turns out there were a ton of relatives, some who had come before the war, some who had survived, and we didn't even know that they were here in America. So this reunion is from 2000, and it's only the East Coast branch of my mother's family that got together. Uh, then things got complicated. This is, in fact, my own dog, Roshi, after he got into the briar patch. And it's a good metaphor for what I felt like after writing the book, because I got into trouble with my family. And we had a very enmeshed family. And it was really, really uh, warm and fuzzy to be in my family. Um, and we all loved each other a lot. But if you tried to turn around or do anything on your own, it really caused complications. And that's what my book did. And my, this is sort of representative. This is, these are not my parents, as you might have guessed, but this is uh, what my family response to After Long Silence was. Uh, my mother was horrified and did not speak to me for the next couple of years. My father was actually pleased that the book came out. He had written his own memoir. He wanted his story told, but, um, he unfortunately was suffering from Parkinson's and so he ended up dying in 2001 and that's what broke my mother's silence. She finally invited me home for my father's funeral and we had a very emotional reunion but six weeks later I found out that I was disowned and declared dead by my family and I hadn't seen that coming. So what I realized is that it wasn't enough to just tell the story of what happened and that there was a deeper story that I had left out of the first book. And that is the effects that the secrets can have on, on family dynamics and the transmission of trauma from one generation to another. And so I realized that I'd only scratched the surface and I felt that I needed to dig deeper and write more about it. And that took just a quick 20 years later um, I finally came out with a second memoir, which in fact uncovered more secrets that helped me understand what had happened to my family. And it delves into the relationships of the sisters, my mother's relationship with her older sister, my relationship with my uh, sister, and basically the effect of intergenerational trauma. So that's it um, in a nutshell. And thank you for having me. <laughs> Helen, thank you so much for being here. My goodness. Um, the pig on the raft. I mean, that's that's memorable. <laughs> Nothing to do with your book, but very memorable. <laughs> uh, all right. Our next author this evening. Our next author this evening is Elena Limbersky. Excuse me. Elena Limbersky. She grew up in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, specifically Soviet Russia, and moved to the US in 1987. After earning a bachelor's from the University of Michigan and a master's from MIT, she worked as an architect in Boston and continued writing and publishing. Her new memoir, Like a Drop of Ink in a Downpour, Memories of Soviet Russia, co-authored with her mother, Galina, is her first book length work of creative nonfiction. She lives in Arlington and can be spotted tossing tennis balls at Monotomy Rocks Park. 
please join me in welcoming Elena Lemberski. Thank, thank you, thank you, Andrea. Um, so I think I will um, begin, if I may, um, by reading an ex excerpt from uh, my memoir. Um, the first, um, the piece that I originally wanted to uh, read, um, when I started reading it, I realized I will not be able to read through it uh, even 40 years after um, everything that had happened. So instead I will read um, a piece from a chapter that's called um, The Rain and the Frost. Um, uh, and then I will um, show some slides. The rain sets in in about mid-September. The Leningrad's rain is not impulsive or passionate like a Shostakovich uh, symphony. It's not brush, no. It's depressing, slow, shallow, and persistent, lingering drizzle that penetrates clothes and lungs. The dull grayness comes with it. The worn out pastels of Khrushchev apartment buildings turn drab, roads blacken, heavy clouds that look like beef broth congeal overhead. My neighbors put on gray garments so that the splatters will blend in. Grain, uh, gray raincoats, hats, and shawls, gray whitenicks. My heart turns gray. Rain seeps into my boots from the top and from the bottom through cracks in the soles. Wet socks, runny nose, sidewalks are littered with soggy cigarette stubs. I have to watch my step. Water seeps below doorways into our foyer. Now and then the drizzle brings in the tender scent from the Gulf of Finland. But more often it is the stinks, the stink of the overflowing storm drains. Puddles form at the side of the road. Cars drive through them too fast. Blasts of water and mud shoot up like flicks of black ostrich fans. Pedestrians slip away. The burlesque of Leningrad's rain, the contest of the biggest mess. And then there are brief moments when the sun comes out and veins of blue sky breaks through the clouds. The puddles sparkle in lapis lazuli and pearl. My white apartment building stands tall as a lighthouse in our pallid neighborhood. In those moments, I feel that everything will always turn out well and my heart brims with gratitude. So I wanted to write this uh, memoir since I was 11 years old when um, three men from Soviet police came to my um, house. Um, my mother and I were about to, the two of us lived together and uh, we were about to emigrate. Uh, the borders were closed uh, in Russia and it was almost impossible to get out. The exception was made um, for Russian, for Soviet Jews, uh, and a small amount, a small number of us were able to get special permission, special exit visa. Uh, so my mother was successful and we had our visa. Um, she had a uh, couple weeks before she had given up her Soviet citizenship and we have given away most of our things and getting ready to leave. Um, but I came home uh, on that day from school and I saw my mother standing in the hallway um, and um, the three men uh, were moving from room to room and tapping um, my mattress and pillows with metal detectors and turning our things upside down. And when they left, um, they took away our exit visa. Um, and um, there was an investigation against my mother. Um, everybody told her that she will be acquitted because the charges were trivial. And um, she received a prison sentence. Um, so I, um, the memoir I wanted to, so I remember feeling um, incredible rage um, that I was not able to protect my mother. 
And all I could do is um, to remember everything and uh, hoping that one day I will write it down. Um, but then years passed and uh, we were finally able to leave. And um, as um, we were leaving, as our airplane was taking off from Leningrad, my mother and I made a promise to each other that um, we will never speak about our past again. We wanted to start, we, this was our new life and we did not want to bring this past into our future. And so when I met people in the, we moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so when people asked what it was like to grow up in Russia, I had, I had nothing. And it wasn't that I was keeping a secret. It's just that that past was, had no relevance to this new life. And I met many people from all over the world, um, in first in Ann Arbor and um, in Cambridge, people from Middle East, from Europe, from Germany, from, from Asia. And um, I always ask them about their childhoods and the places where they grew up and their stories, their places, um, became my stories and my roots. And that was enough. And then, um, so I didn't tell, I didn't tell about this uh, to my husband until five years into our marriage. And I didn't tell anything to my children um, as they were growing up and reaching the age I was when um, the three men came to our home. Um, I was watching with shock and horror that they were quite fond of Russia. They never visited um, and their reference to Russia was the School of Russian Math and um, the cartoons and sweets we brought from the Russian store. And so I had to tell them how it was, but it was impossible for me to talk about this. So I started to write down um, my memories. And then my mother gave me the recordings. Um, we recorded her memories um, and put our narratives together. Um, and what surprised me, the story that was, uh, that came out that wrote itself on the pages was not full of rage. Um, it had all the sweet memories, tender, tender, sweet memories of the place I grew up. Um, and they were incredibly well-preserved, like um, little ice mummies that were coming out from the melting snow. Um, so, uh, the book is made of three parts. Um, yes, and so, so well, as I was struggling, as I, as I was writing as, and struggling to go to those more difficult years when my mother, mother was away and I was alone, I kept going to the earlier memories as a safe place. Um, so the book is made of three parts. Um, the first part is told in the voice of a young girl me growing up uh, in Leningrad in the 70s. Um, and I tell about um, our neighborhood and playing in the backyard. Um, I also talk about my school lessons uh, and what it was like to grow up uh, Jewish in a Jewish family in the country uh, with state endorsed anti Semitism the secrets my family had to keep and uh, my first memories of my grandfather's uh, paintings. Uh, and um, including his um, three paintings of Babi Yar, um, 
my grandmother never told me what Babi Yar was. Um, and she never spoke about Holocaust. Uh, the second um, part is my mother's. Um, and she talks about her growing up in post-war Russia, um, about her jobs, um, including a temporary job she took in a hair salon after she began to apply for immigration. When she worked, when she went to work for this hair salon, a job that uh, was innocent, she thought, she saw a vast uh, unbound corruption, theft, uh, bribes, at the scale she never could imagine uh, were possible. She um, was not participating in it, but the fact that she knew about it and knew the people who um, were involved in this, uh, basically landed her um, in prison. So she talks also about her experience in prison and the labor camp. Um, and the third part is back to me um, as an adolescent after she came back um, and we had to find a way to live and a place to live and um, rebuild our life. She continued to apply for immigration um, and got refused year after year uh, with the same explanation, not in the interest of the state. Um, and at that time, uh, we had no hope uh, of ever getting out. And in the 80s, if you lived in the Soviet Union, you could not have imagined the possibility that uh, just in few years, um, the Soviet Union would um, cease to exist. Um, my book um, will be released um, in um, next week on January 18th, but this is a review copy. Um, I want to show a couple more slides. So this is the uh, cover um, of um, my book. Um, it was designed by Whitney Scherer. Um, when Whitney sent uh, me the first several options um, of the possible covers that we could uh, use, uh, they were absolutely stunningly beautiful. And my first thought was, how would we ever uh, choose uh, just one? And in the end, we chose this image um, of um, Leningrad courtyard because it expressed the spirit of life in uh, Russia, reach for the sky when nothing else is within reach. Um, you will uh, find these courtyards in the center, in the old part of Leningrad where my mother grew up after World War II. From the street, uh, the building facade would look like this. Sorry for the small slide. Uh, but if you sidestep, if you step in the alley and keep walking, um, you will find these courtyards um, They turn out really small. Um, and some of them are quite narrow. From the window, uh, if your window looks in the back, uh, you might see uh, a brick wall. And then you have to look up to see the light. This image is uh, Christy, uh, the prison where my mother was taken after her trial. The name Christy means the crosses uh, because the buildings are built uh, in, a fair, in the form of a cross. It was a very old prison. Um, the windows of the cell were covered with metal louvers that were turned up and you could only see narrow strips of light. When prisoners were taken on their walk, 
they were brought to another small cell uh, that had no roof. Um, it had tall brick uh, blind walls and the prisoners had to walk in a single file without talking to each other. But then you could look up and you would see the square of the sky. I want to thank everybody at Arlington uh, Salon, um, Anjali, Whitney, Andrea, and everyone who created this wonderful um, opportunity for us to share our work. Um, it's an honor to present with Helen and uh, Vena. Um, I just finished reading both of your books and they're just exquisite. Uh, so thank you for everyone for joining us online. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you for joining us. And I am glad that you were patient with yourself about the images because they were amazing to see. And I think I speak for the rest of the audience when I say that. <laughs> Our next and final author of this evening is Wena Dyrandell. She is the award-winning author of three novels, The Last Rose of Shanghai, The Moon in the Palace, and The Empress of the Bright, of Bright Moon, a historical duology about Wu Zechen, China's only female emperor. The Last Rose of Shanghai was named the best historical fiction of 2021 by Wild China and was selected as the most anticipated book of 2021 by Bustle. Wena is the winner of, of the RWA Rita Award, the Goodreads Choice Award for Best Historical Fiction semifinalist, and the RT Book Reviewer's Choice Best First Historical Nominee. The Empress of Bright Moon series has been translated into seven languages and sold worldwide. Please welcome to our virtual stage, Wena Dyrandell. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. And I have some slides I would like to show everybody. Um, before I start my talk, I would really like to thank everybody for making this happen for me. Uh, thank you so much to Anjali for inviting me. This is incredible. I'm new to Boston and I haven't had a chance to meet the writers in this community. This is a perfect opportunity for me. And it's so wonderful to see all the people are coming to listen to us. Um, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you so much to Arlington Author Salon and thank you to Andrea and to Whitney for helping out make this happen. Uh, now I'm gonna go to the next slide. Let's see. So uh, I've written and published three novels so far. The first two novels are called The Moon in the Palace and The Empress of Bright Moon. They are called a duology. Um, I know many of you are familiar with this word, but in case you don't, it's a series of two books. So when I um, started to have this idea of writing the book featuring the first Chinese Empress, a uh, Chinese Emperor, female Emperor. I pitched to the publisher as three books as a trilogy. They declined the third one. So now we have the duology, the Moon the Palace and the Empress of Right Moon. And this duology described the journey of a 13 year old girl who was summoned to serve the emperor in the palace and describe the journey of her rise from a uh, low ranking concubine to the ruler of the country. Um, so I published these novels in 2016 at once. They came out back to back. It was a very interesting marketing strategy for me. Um, I wanted to add, it took me about 10 years to write The Moon in a Palace. I know in, a, in the life of a writer, a few years is like nothing. And sometimes 
a few months went by, years go by and nothing happened. 10 years ago is a long time. And I received 82 rejection letters from agents. So I just want to throw this out there in case there are some aspiring writers who are in the stage of querying agents. Don't give up. Keep writing. Keep querying. Somebody out there is going to offer a representation to you, and you are going to get published. You are going to fulfill your writer's dream. Just don't give up. So um, now I'm going to talk about the last rooms of Shanghai. It was published last year in December, the last month of the year. Again, it was not something I have in control, just to let you know. But I did have some saying in the design of the cover, which was very nice for the publisher to consider my suggestion. Uh, when they sent me the concept, the cover was not like that and the dress was blue. So I asked them to use my wedding dress, which is exactly the same wedding dress that I have. And they took my suggestion and used the color and the tone. Okay, so now uh, why did I decide to write a historical novel, The Last Rose of Shanghai? There are a few reasons. Um, I would say maybe four reasons and I'm gonna get to them. The first one is, as you can see, I'm, I'm Chinese, I'm a Chinese American. I was born and raised in China. I grew up in China, I was educated there, I went to school there. Um, I also spent five years in Shanghai and I worked and I studied in the college there. And during my years in Shanghai, I learned some history. Um, I learned during World War II, Shanghai was a haven for Jewish refugees. There were about 18,000 Jews who were prosecuted in Nazi Germany and they had nowhere to go because they couldn't find entry visas to the country, but they managed to find entry visas to China, to Shanghai specifically. So they fled to Shanghai and they survived the war because they lived in Shanghai. And I also learned that after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese took over the entire China, the entire Shanghai, I'm sorry. Je Japanese took over the entire Shanghai. And they arrested many foreigners in Shanghai. They included the Americans, British, the Dutch. They, because they considered them as alien enemies and they arrested all of them in Shanghai and put them in five internment camps in Shanghai. So this part of history, I don't think it's very well known, but some people are familiar with that. If you have read uh, the Empire of the Sun, the author actually was a victim of that and his entire family was sent to an internment camp in Shanghai. So he wrote about that. Um, this part of history, again, I said many people in China actually were not familiar with that either. Again, there's another rumor I heard in Shanghai when I was working in Shanghai. Uh, I often passed a brick building, a red brick building in Shanghai, and it was it said it was a church, Moses Church. And I didn't give any indication. I didn't even think twice of it. But now I know it actually was not church, it was a synagogue. But in Chinese, church and synagogue, they are the same thing. Um, the rumor said many Jewish people, Jewish refugees lived in a specific area called Shanghai Ghetto. Shanghai Jewish ghetto in Shanghai. And after Pearl Harbor, because all those wealthy American Jews, British Jews were sent to internment camps, 
the Jews were left on their own and they were living in an absolutely horrible condition. They had no food. They could not communicate with the local Shanghainese. They could not find a job and the living condition was absolutely horrible. During that time, the, room, uh, the local people said many Shanghai people actually throw loaves of bread into the alleys to feed those Jewish refugees. Now, you know, I, I thought it was very impressive. I still remember the rumor, but I have to say that when I was researching, I could not verify if that was true or not. It was just a rumor. So um, the second reason I wanted to write that is I married an American guy, and he's actually Jewish. But when I married him, I did not know he was Jewish. See, for me, if you are not Chinese, then everybody is a foreigner. That's the concept that Chinese people have in China. If you're not Chinese, then you are a foreigner. It doesn't matter what kind of religion you believe in. So when we got married, my husband broke a glass and I did not know what that meant at all. And I was just happy that I got married. I married the man I love. However, because I am gonna get into the personal story here because I chose to marry an American. It was not a very happy moment for my family, especially my parents. My mom, was very upset. My dad threw a huge fit. He refused to talk to me for many months. And when we got married, nobody from my side of family showed up. And it was a very small wedding and I was wearing my traditional Chinese dress. My husband's family side, they were very smart. They checked me out before the marriage and make sure I was acceptable. Um, but this kind of family and personal experience has and does something to me. So I, I know two cultures, when they are united, it's not always a happy moment for everyone. So the third reason that I wanted to write The Last Rose of Shanghai is, I started to write this novel in 2018. That was two years after I published The Moon in the Palace and The Empress of Red Moon. But I, I felt like I, I was a legitimate historical writer and I, I knew many writers who actually published historical novels, but they were all, most of them were all set in, the, in Europe and they described people in Europe, their plight and their difficulties, their sufferings. And it's absolutely great. However, I felt there were not a lot of people who actually knew what happened in China during World War II because Japan was a member of ASICS. Japan was worked together with Nazi Germany and they committed horrible crimes in China. And I wanted people here to hear that it happened and how Chinese people suffered. And the most beautiful thing is among all the suffering, Jewish refugees, they went to China and they, were, they survived. And they actually formed some kind of friendship with the Chinese people there. I think this is very exciting for me. And this is the story I want to tell. Many of my Jewish relatives have no idea about this part of history. They did not know that many Jewish people actually fled to Shanghai and survived and how they interacted with the local people in Shanghai. So when I told them I was, I was writing this book and they were very surprised as well. So um, the, the last reason that I wanted to write The Last Rose of Shanghai was um, 
in 2018, a friend told me that I would be a good candidate to write this kind of story because my daughter was becoming a bat mitzvah the next year. So I was like, oh yes, this is perfect. I can write this novel. So this would be something I can do to honor my Jewish family's heritage. And I also want my novels to be a bridge, a bridge of understanding for people here. So people in this country and uh, outside this country will understand the World War II was devastating and it happened. And many people in this world suffered. And many stories are still out there. And if you are open, you will, you can hear those stories. And I wanted my story to be a bridge where you can get a better sense of the world of Chinese people, of Chinese culture. Okay, I'm gonna move to the next slide. So in the last rose of Shanghai, last rose of Shanghai is a story, is a love story. And it's a love story between a wealthy Chinese woman and a penniless German Jewish refugee. Um, I decided to tell is uh, to characterize my main characters, a wealthy Chinese nightclub owner, because I'm interested in writing strong and flawed female characters, and I wanted to um, describe Chinese women in an empathetic light that will reveal the strength and the weaknesses. And I also wanted to make sure that people will understand that there were many brilliant Chinese women uh, out there. And this character was based on the first Chinese female entrepreneur in China. And he, she was a historical figure. She lived in 1930s. During that time, many American women were not allowed to take a job, but she owned a nightclub. Her name was called Ai Sheng. So I took her first name, but didn't use her last name. So for my main character, male character, German Jew, her name, his name is called Ernest Reisman. And the reason I named him Ernest was because I read a very moving memoir by a Jewish refugee. It's called Shanghai Refuge. And I was very moved, very touched by the book. I decided to name my main character after the author. He has ever, he has passed away by now, but his book was very helpful for me to understand German Jews mindset. And uh, so, um, yeah, that's how I decided to name the book after him. So I think I only have a few minutes left. So I'm going to go walk through this slides very fast. Then I will read a few paragraphs from The Last Rose of Shanghai. OK, so next one is, in The Last Rose of Shanghai, you will see some historical figures. But one main one is called Sir Victor Sassoon. He was a wealthy playboy. He was called the, the wealthiest man in Asia. And uh, he was very helpful to Jewish refugees in Shanghai. He was also the owner of the Peace Hotel. Currently, it's called the Fermont Peace Hotel in Shanghai. If you go to Shanghai and you visit the Bond area, you will not miss the building. And another two historical figures is called Shao Xunmei. He was a poet. He was a prominent poet in Shanghai. And he had an affair with an American journalist called Emily Hahn for five years. So these two historical figures were also featured in the book. 
And the fourth historical figure I want to mention is Laura Margolis. And she was a social worker. She was sent to Shanghai in 1940 to help 8,000 Jewish refugees because they were living in absolutely horrible living conditions. And she was instrumental in improving the condition for the refugees. But after Pearl Harbor, she was also arrested and sent to the internment camp in Shanghai. She was released about a year later, but many people were actually uh, confined in the camps until the end of World War II. So jazz, you know, jazz in Shanghai was featured prominently because it was very popular in China in that time. And this is my book here. So um, now I think I have a few minutes. I'm gonna just read a few paragraphs here. So this is in the middle of the book. So before this, you, uh, Ernest parents was stuck in Germany. And the, the, case, the thing happened with them was they are a family of four, but they were only able to receive two exit visas. So the parents told Ernest to take the sister with him. They could go, they could leave Germany and go to Shanghai. And this is a few years after that. Often Ernest thought of his parents. So one day he visited a synagogue, the Oshel Rachel, built by the great uncle of Sir Sassoon. He didn't know what he wished to see, entering the majestic entryway with rusticated pillars, passing scores of white-robed yeshiva students who had arrived from Europe with forged passports last year. Ernest sat by a round window near the ark that held the Torah. In front of him were empty chairs, tables, and candles, solitary, like something left behind. He heard some prayers from the students, but couldn't join, unfamiliar with what they were praying. Then he sneezed. Embarrassed, he stood up and left. He visited the synagogue again a few days later. The sanctuary was walled, windows sealed by tar paper and dim. Yet he felt relaxed this time. He breathed in the air, itched by the plumes of pale daylight running through the door. He could hear the beats of wind small flies, the rush of the breeze, and the faint prayer like a distant voice. The place felt vast, endless, full of unfathomable codes, like a great pensive mind. He put his hand on the chair in front of him. Its armrest was damp from incessant rain and smoothed by many hands before him and it would be smoothed again by many after him. He wondered if this was what his parents felt when they came to temple, to feel the togetherness, to feel the pulse of life, to become part of tradition that bound generations past and generations to come. He was not a religious man, but he was still a Jew. He prayed for Leah and his parents, with faces, smiles, voices, and frowns, would forever stand in the altar of his memories, for Miriam, whom he had disappointed, but would always protect. For Ai, whom he loved and would always love. And for Mr. Schmidt, the people working in his bakery and the refugees in Shanghai, who were his new family, for whom security and comfort had remained elusive. He wished them the light of peace, the eternal joys, and the unbroken spirit for years to come. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much, Wena. And now we will bring um, Helen and Elena back on stage, so to speak, and have our Q&A. 
I want to start by just thanking you again and giving you a round of applause for our whole audience. Um, this was a wonderful evening of readings. And um, I want to remind folks in the viewing audience that our next salon is April 7th. Um, so getting to questions, uh, one of the questions that came up right away um, during actually Helen's, Helen's reading was to the, the idea of your parents somehow finding each other again. How did they find each other again? How did your father know to go to Rome? It was a really um, complicated story that he had a music teacher that, um, that had managed to save a postcard that my mother had sent at the end of the uh, war and trying to find out what had happened to him. And this was a Ukrainian music teacher of his and she held on to it. And he managed to get, because of the way the borders changed, even though she had been part or in his hometown, his hometown was now behind the Iron Curtain. So when he was jumping trains, he hadn't yet had to cross the border into the, uh, to Europe. And he stopped in and found her because she hadn't been killed. She in fact had been hiding his own mother until his mother was, was taken away. And she brought out this postcard from a year and a half before that she'd held on to, <clears throat> excuse me, and it had the address in Rome. And he didn't know whether my mother was still there, <clears throat> excuse me. So, but he had that goal in mind. And when he did finally get across the border, he telegrammed and she responded back. And she said, okay, I'll wait for you. Do you want me to come there or shall I come to you? And he said, wait, I'll come to you. And it took him many months to, um, because he had no papers. He was a, a fugitive, but he ended up, I think he got help with the Jewish organization, the underground, the Brecha helped him uh, cross over and he walked across Europe and ended up hiking across the Alps um, <clears throat> and found her. So he knew that that was his goal. Amazing. This next question is for Elena. Did you write in English or did you write in Russian and translate to English? And how did your fluency in Russian influence your choice of words? Okay, thank you for this question. I actually, it's very interesting that I, when I write uh, in English directly, it's very, very different uh, from writing in Russian. And uh, it's not even the matter of um, words and the limitation of uh, English as a second language. It's almost how you view yourself. Um, you really truly view yourself differently depending on the language you're speaking. Um, so I had to write in Russian um, for it to be authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was, uh, and. Vena was saying about writing for 10 years. It took me 10 years to write this book. Uh, and half of it was rewriting it. And so, um, so I wrote pieces in Russian and then I was translating. And then towards the end, I was writing directly in English, just little pieces and uh, connecting it. And yeah, so that was the process. Thank you, so interesting. Um... This question is for Wena from Carolyn. Um, has there been healing between you and your husband's family, your family and your husband's family? Um, I would say my, my husband's family has been gracious. My in-laws have been very gracious since the very beginning, but not everyone else, <laughs> obviously. Um, but, um, but I think they grow to accept me, everybody. Um, if we're gonna, we're gonna have 20 years of wedding anniversary, at one point you have to just accept, right? If not, that's too bad. Um, for, my, for my own family, my parents, uh, it was a different thing, I guess. My dad is very, very kind of, very stubborn. It took him almost five years to finally reconcile. And then he started really like to speak to my husband, but my husband, Mark doesn't speak Chinese. My husband, my dad doesn't speak English. So when they 
stand together, they, the best thing they can do is say, hello, ni hao, that's it. <laughs> uh, and for one, once we, ha we had a kids, my family completely different. They just started to be very involved and they talked to my parents and my kids and that, I think that's completely fine now. Wow. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And actually, there was another audience question for Helen on this same topic um, of, of, you know, thawing. Has, has, have people thawed in, in your direction? Uh, you know, not really. What they've done is they've died. <laughs> and so, I mean, my parents died, my cousin died, even his daughter died. Um, so it's really, there are very few left of us uh, in, the, in that nuclear family. We just sort of, you know, it didn't blow over, we blew up. Um, but there are so many other family members that I didn't know I had. So in many ways, it's, it's also, I think, um, you know, to some extent, it's illusory if, that we had this incredibly loving and close relationship in my family. But, um, but when push came, it, it depended on a lot of false fronts. And it, if I want, if I could no longer live within that constraint, then as Wina said, I think the, it, it, so be it, you know, at a certain point you have to just, some things can't be fixed. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have a, another question from Robert for Elena. What was the process like writing the book with your mother? Was it hard for her to go back to those memories and how did she feel, how does she feel about the book being published now? Thank you for this question. Yes, yes. Uh, well, so my mom is quite amazing and we are very connected, I think, to, to each other. I think in some ways we are as close as Helen's mother and uh, her sister. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very, very close connection. And um, um, so when I told her, so I was writing uh, for a while without telling her because I really wanted this to be my project and not uh, her project, uh, my writing. Um, and so when I finally told her that I wanted to do this memoir, her first reaction is why? Why, why, you know, go back and, and just, you know, face all this difficult, why, why, why relieve all this difficult uh, life? But I think also she was very happy um, because, um, because she never received justice. And, yeah. um, and some, some political prisoners, some prisoners who were accused of criminal crimes, but who were really incarcerated for political reasons in Russia, many of them received, um, I keep forgetting the word, um, they, their, their prison sentences are overturned, right? So they uh, are announced to be innocent. And it never happened for my mother because we left uh, and we were not um, living there. Um, so, so I think part of her was grateful uh, and happy to be able to share her story. And when we were recording um, uh, her, her, her story, we actually had to be in separate, you know, she was in her house and I was in my house and we did it over the phone mm -hmm. because I think just, just being together and, and having this all come out that we had shared would just be, just would be impossible. So, you know, we could leave our own emotions in the privacy of our home and mm -hmm. uh, pretend to be strong for each other. And, uh, um, and then we edited together and uh, we are very different writers. I'm more visual. She likes everything to be short and to the point. And um, so she would give me these gorgeous paragraphs. Um, and then as we were editing, she would say, okay, just take this one out, take this word out, take the sentence out. And by the end, uh, with nothing left of her beautiful <laughs> sentence. So, I, <laughs> so we did this for, a, I think for a year. And then I finally, <laughs> I finally, um, yeah, so, so her part is her voice, but with uh, some of my editorial discretions. Um, but, you know, it's been a wonderful shared experience. And I'm, I, would, mm -hmm. 
I was going to ask how you could do that. I mean, did it ever, I mean, you said yourself that you were hoping to write your, you know, you're finally carving out your own voice. And that's what I was, I, I, I'm such a bad collaborator. <laughs> it would be so complicated to do that with, with my own mother because we you know, love each other so much. And it's just like, it would be impossible. I don't know. Did you have any of that? You don't have to tell us. I, uh, right. Well, I have to. I have to tell you, Helen, because I was reading last night. Um, um, I was reading last night your part where you are writing about, uh, you know, picking, choosing colleges and and trying to, and in the end, really trying to please your mother in everything you do and say. And I have to say, you know, at you all these years, everything I do, I feel like I'm doing to please my mother. Mm. <laughs> there day. was actually there was a question from the audience uh, an audience member about how you got to wellesley <laughs> <laughs> oh me how i got to for, wellesley? for helen yes oh um i i dropped out of high school and and it was when i i just looked at two colleges because my mother was saying you know you you go to college for an education you don't go for a husband and uh, so stick to women's colleges. And then it was basically, my sister was going to one women's college and I thought, I'm either gonna go to hers or I'll go to Wellesley. And I think my mother, just for whatever reason, she fell in love with the campus and I wanted to give her Wellesley. So I went, I wasn't unhappy with that, but it was what we do for our mothers. What about you, Raina? Do you feel like your parents um, influenced your writing at all? Okay, so uh, my mom actually had passed away mm. uh, a few years ago, but my dad is always a character, and I've been fighting against him since, like, uh, I can't remember. He always told me, Wayna, go get a job. Don't be a writer. It's a <laughs> terrible thing. You cannot support yourself. Go get a job. Be a doctor or an uh -huh. attorney. So that'll be perfect job for Chinese girl, right? But I didn't want to be a teacher. I did not want to be a doctor. I did not want to do any of those. So, and then he, he said, marry somebody who's a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I was like, well, I don't know what to do, but I, I just married the person that he expected the least, an American. He, he was not happy with that. Not so, happy. Yeah, I, I had this kind of rebellious streak, I guess. <laughs> uh -huh. we, we all right. have something we have going for... on. <laughs> oh, sorry, we have, we have time for one more question. And I think it's a question that many people in the audience will be interested in the answer to. Um, what are the next projects that you are each working on? And we'll start with Elena. Well, um, I think the obvious uh, with me, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For me, the obvious is to finish my the Russian version of this book, and um, and then um, I have stories that were uh, that ended up on a cutting floor, on an editing floor, mm -hmm. uh, that I would like to make a book of stories. Um, I have a few ideas. I, I'm actually inspired by Whitney Whitney Scherer's uh, biographical uh, novel of. Um, Lee Miller, uh, the book she wrote um, in the day of light, uh, the days of light, uh, that a beautiful story about the American photographer and the model, uh, just riveting story. And um, I'm inspired by uh, biographical fiction and Venus work, and I want to find some strong protagonist from maybe Soviet history and write a novel. Yeah. Mm. All right. Thank you, uh, Wayna. Would you like to go next? Uh, okay, so my next novel is called The Angels of Vienna. It's set in Vienna, Austria, between 1938 after the Anschluss to 1940 after the years that the war started. It features uh, a an Chinese American, not really. She's like half Chinese, half Irish, but she lives She's a Bastonian because I love Boston so far. <laughs> I just, I moved here last year and I love everything about this state and this city and 
the culture and the history. So I made my character a Bostonian. And she's, she's uh, a wife of diplomat. And it will be released in February 2023. Excellent. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Helen? So yes. I, I'm so blown away by your, uh, your, your plans and your knowledge, both of you, of what you're doing. I, I never know what I'm doing and until it's too late. And I think I, after the first memoir, I was so relieved to be done with memoir. I wanted to go back to fiction and I found myself writing more memoir. And after this one, I thought, thank God I can go back to fiction. I spent a year just writing stories and it was just so much fun. And, and now I'm working on something that God help me looks like memoir. And I know I shouldn't, but that's where it seems to be going. And there's actually a little bit that I have. When you get really, really old, there's lots and lots of parts of your life that that you have yet to mine. So I, I don't know what will happen. I, I'll find out. I actually am inspired. If I had any sense, I would do some research and write a historical novel because it's it's really challenging. But, but yes, but Helen, your, your memoir reads like a novel. And you <laughs> it was absolutely stunning for me to read The Escape Artist. I just couldn't put it down. The oh. prose was impeccable. And you had an excellent sense of hooking the readers from very beginning and you know when to release it go into the background this is exactly historical wow. novel. <laughs> well, thank you because i feel the same about your book so we can have you know a mutual fan club but um, it really is it's, it's such an honor for me to be um with both of you and i'm so grateful to to you andrea and angeli angeli and to all of you at uh, arlington Father salon for putting these together. It's it's putting us together and putting these uh, salons together. So thank you. Oh, well, it, it is a pleasure. It really is. Um, I want to thank our audience. Um, I also wanted to remind you again that our next salon is April 7th, and you can sign up for notices about future salons through the salon webpage or through the library's uh, monthly newsletter. So thank you again, Helen Fremont, Elena Limberski and Wayne Adele Dyrandell. I, I, it's been just a fantastic evening with you and I wish you all luck in your future writing endeavors. We'll see you soon.